Emily, William, and Patty took a two-block ride in a Pontiac. The car bro broke down, so they took a Chevrolet. The Chevrolet got them to Tom Matthews' house. They borrowed his van for the next 12 hours and took Tom along for the ride. William Harris introduced Tanya to Tom Matthews, and Tanya told Tom the whole story about what an enthusiastic member of the SLA she was. Then they all went to a drive-in movie and saw The New Centurions. I should just mention parenthetically, The New Centurions is a cop movie based on a novel by Joseph Wambaugh. About the LAPD. <laughs> about the Los Angeles Police Department. Tom Matthews' account of that 12-hour, quote, kidnapping gave the DA the excuse they needed to file 19 charges against Patty Hearst by the next Monday morning. May 17, 1974, State of Siege, Public Cremation, Patty observes. 6 o'clock a.m., Tom Matthews is allowed to drive away in his van, leaving Emily, Patty, and William on foot in the Hollywood Hills. 6 o'clock a.m., an assault task force of police, FBI, and U.S. Treasury agents surround the house on West 84th Street. At 9 a.m., ten canisters of tear gas are fired into the house. Minutes later, members of the LAPD Special Weapons and Tactics Team, SWAT, charged the house. Nobody was inside. There was a two-hour wait before they attacked the empty residence. 8 o'clock. The three SLA members, Emily, William, Patty, turn up in, the Griffith, in Griffith Park and drive off in a Lincoln Continental. Two women with a gun say, We need your car for a couple of hours. Frank Sutter obligingly gives them $250. 9 o'clock a.m. Donald DeFries and an unidentified black man look at a vacant apartment on 54th Street with the idea of renting it. The house at 1466 East 54th was filled with activity. On Thursday night, there was wine and grass, guests traffic in and out, weapons delivered and packed under the floorboards, and food brought in on request. The SLA was trying to recruit new members for their army. 11 o'clock a.m., one black man left, saying he would be back with transportation. Police are gathering in the streets. 3.30 p.m., two black men depart, taking Patricia Hurst with them. Where are the Harrises? One whispers into DeFries's ear. 5 o'clock p.m. One black man departs from the front door just before the shooting. 5 o'clock p.m. Lawmen, who claim they use a bullhorn that nobody heard, said, quote, Come out with your hands up, the house is surrounded. Five minutes elapsed between the first and second warnings. Why not two hours this time? Two minutes later, a policeman fired a tear gas shell into the house. Heavy gunfire followed. Incendiary bombs were thrown into the house by the FBI. The house went up in flames. A fire chief who wanted to go in and put out the flames was threatened with an arrest by an FBI man if he crossed the police line. By 6.45 p.m., the fire had burned the house to the ground. Donald DeFries, Nancy Ling Perry, William Wolf, Patricia Soltisic, Angela Atwood and Camilla Hall were burned beyond recognition. Patty Hearst witnessed the cremation of her friends from a nearby apartment. Sadism and cruelty were employed in every carefully staged scene of this dreadful conspiracy. May 19, 1974. Patty Hearst in Hollywood assaulting Mrs. Alcala. Anita Alcala, manager of an apartment house, turned down an offer of $500 rental for one night. Two black men and, quote, Patty Hearst said they needed a room. Do you want to die? asked Patty, with blue eyes this time. One of the men stepped forward and slashed at Mrs. Alcala's dress. The house dress was cut at least six inches. The picture of the dress resembled LBJ showing his scar following surgery. The unverified episode, with descriptions that didn't match Patty, could give her life in prison if she is found alive. May 19, 1974. Only three SLA members left. Emily and William Harris, and Patty Hearst. Stage one of the SLA was over. Randolph Hearst assumed his daughter could now, quote, vanish. The scenario included murder, kidnapping, bank robbery, and cremation. Now the hunt begins. The word terrorist has become as American as apple pie. Okay, after reading that last section, um, uh, we saw uh, several of the points that May is making are... are uh, completely self-evident, but just to recap and sort of to look through them, uh, what we're talking about here is a radical group that is made up of um, previously unpolitical uh, Berkeley locals and out-of-state 
um, or in some cases out of country people with a background in uh, police informing or in the case of Colson and Westbrook, uh, CIA behavioral programming in the Phoenix program in Vietnam, which was essentially an assassination and terror program, as uh, people who have studied the Phoenix program are quite well aware. Now, the other interesting thing is that this, uh, this intelligence-created uh, uh, terrorist group um, then manages to go in the most uh, completely uh, uh, reverse way possible of making itself an effective force. Um, they do absolutely nothing to do any good for anybody besides the possible concept of the free food giveaway, which, as May mentioned, is totally flawed from the beginning, um, and then, in fact, turn around... Uh, pull a number of absolutely meaningless jobs, including the uh, the Hibernia Bank job in which uh, they managed to get themselves photographed some 1,200 times without ba bothering to uh, uh, put out the cameras. Um, they spend the money on virtually nothing. Uh, apparently, they, they were either so poor that they had to shoplift sweat socks, which is doubtful, or in fact, what happened is the, the, the shoplifting of sweat socks was merely an excuse to make themselves public again. Uh, to reveal the fact that, in fact, they were in the Los Angeles area. It later led, of course, to the 12-hour kidnapping of Tom Matthews, at which point they drove around, took him to a drive-in movie, explained that they were the Symbionese Liberation Army, and this was Tanya, otherwise known as Patty Hearst. Uh, meanwhile, Sin Q is holding a recruiting section with, session with the doors open and people wandering in and out. It should be noted that, uh, intriguingly enough, perhaps this is a characteristic of... Uh uh, wealthy uh, daughters who become revolutionaries. Patty's eyes changed color from brown to blue and back again several times. If one can accept that this is Patty, obviously that's tongue in cheek. It obviously wasn't if her eyes changed color. Indeed, we have a number of people running around. Um, some of them, uh, or all of them, claiming to be members of the uh, Symbionese Liberation Army, as Dave mentioned, with uh, the most notable figure of the group, Patty Hearst, her eyes changing color several times. We have a number of meaningless uh, public altercations occurring. Um, which give the Simeonese Liberation Army an excuse to run around, fire guns at people, uh, generally make their presence known, and have pictures of themselves taken uh, with guns, and uh, have it noted that Patricia Hearst is firing automatic weapons. And then uh, Field Marshal Sin Q, this, uh, as seems pretty obvious, this poor dupe, uh, holding an open recruiting session uh, in the, the house that eventually became the, uh, the funeral pyre for the large, for uh, five members of the SLA, holding an co open recruiting session with unknown people walking in and out of the doors, bringing guns in and out, uh, drinking, talking, basically a cocktail party. This from a group that uh, one member, at least of which, was on the ten most wanted list of the country. Well, folks, um, if these people were in fact the radical group that they purported to be, if in fact they had read um, the books on the revolution in Chi in, uh, in Cuba and uh, on revolutionary and guerrilla movements. Uh, it seems to me they would have known a little better than to be shoplifting sweat socks in a sporting goods store while carrying automatic weapons. Uh, they would have known better than to be driving around in a van for 12 hours and then allowing the kidnapped owner of that van to drop them off on foot in the Hollywood Hills and to hold open recruiting sessions with the doors open and people walking in and out drinking wine uh, like a suburban uh, literary party of some kind. Uh, basically, this was either one of two things. Either a group of incredibly inept people who somehow, through a fantastic series of coincidences, the, the main, uh, the leaders of which were allowed to walk out of prison uh, just through the sheer luck and, and inexplicable in, uh, non-alertness of the prison authorities, who at the meantime were at war against what they felt to be the biggest threat to the correctional system in, in its history, namely radicalism, all of which, uh, the, all of these people uh, being involved with that radicalism, so either this incredibly inept group just managed to somehow stumble out of prison, stumble together into automatic, automatic weapons, and stumble around the country without being caught for some great length of time, um, taking with them one of the best-known women in the country, or, um, as seems more and more obvious, in fact, this was a group that was designed and manipulated specifically for the purpose of throwing a monkey wrench into the California prison movement, into radical movements in general, and to putting into uh, putting into disfavor uh, a lot of the radical politics of that country, uh, the the country at that time, by linking them to the kind of slogans that people like Donald DeFries were mouthing as they were hauling off uh, heiresses at gunpoint. And uh, we're going to develop the whole scenario of the of uh, the SLA as as provocateur here in a second. Again, the the massive contradictions. 
in terms of background, where you have police intelligence agents, uh, CIA agents, and uh, nice middle-of-the-road, uh, clean-cut conservative kids from the Midwest suddenly forming uh, America's first revolutionary group, quote-unquote. Uh, it's worth noting, how the before we continue with, it, with May's analysis, how prophetic this article is, where May said at the conclusion of the last section that terrorism has become an, as American as apple pie. Uh, that's a statement which I think carries even more weight today than it did at the time. The next section of May Brussels article that we're going to analyze here is, or, or read to you is called The Telltale Revolutionaries, Conspicuous Bandidos or Provocateur. Were documents planted in specific SLA safe houses for political use? Why did Senator John Harmer and U.S. Attorney General William Saxby use the flimsy SLA evidence for Red Scare tactics? We are becoming aware that the CIA faked and planted the diaries, unquote, of Lee Harvey Oswald, Saran Saran, and Arthur Bremer. The same methods of falsifying evidence to back up a conspiracy cover story were used with the SLA. William Saxby referred to the mini-manual of the urban guerrilla by Carlos Marighella, M-A-R-I-G-H-E-L-A, saying, quote, the food program and the Hearst kidnapping came right out of the book, unquote. He intimated that this document proved the SLA was part of an international terrorist group. Quote, when you think that the Symbionese and others are taking this right out of some Maoist doctrinal textbooks on how to operate in terrorism and other forms of civil, dis civil disturbance, you realize it is not just a coincidental thing. There is evidence of a worldwide conspiracy, but it cannot be discussed further, unquote. That a quote from Attorney General William Saxby. Marighella, a Brazilian revolutionary, published the book, which is popular in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. He was killed by the Brazilian police in 1969. Every important suggestion about urban guerrilla warfare, which was quoted by the newspapers to prove, unquote, that the SLA had followed this manual, was in fact totally ignored by the SLA. Indeed, if they had followed the book, they might still be alive today. It is hard to say what rules, if any, the SLA did follow, but one thing is certain. They did not go by the Marighella Manual. The book served only one purpose, identical to the planted diaries. It supplied the match for the political fires of lawmakers and politicians. It served as false evidence, unquote, to prove a lie. To give only one of many examples, one suggestion of the mini-manual mini -manual was, quote, never leave a track or trail, unquote. Why, then, did the SLA, SLA leave not one but three safe houses full of incriminating evidence? Why did Russell Little allow himself to be arrested on January 10, 1974, and to be indicted for the murder of Dr. Marcus Foster? And why did Joseph Ramiro surrender to police four hours later wearing one of the murder weapons? He had spent the last few hours inside the SLA safe house two blocks away discussing the situation with his SLA comrades. It was decided to sacrifice Ramiro, but why did he surrender wearing evidence that linked him to the Foster murder? His comrades could have thrown the gun away for him. Why were Ramiro and Little placed immediately upon their arrest on death row in San Quentin without a trial? How many other persons received this special treatment? Were they placed inside the prison to link the SLA to new recruits, unquote, and to give the impression that the army numbered more than nine persons? In March of 1974, a prisoner in Soledad was offered a chance to escape, unquote, by three prison officials if he would join the SLA army, unquote. How did the police and prison personnel know where the SLA was? Why would they want to help them recruit more troops, except to link the terrorists later on with prison escapees? The house at 1560 Sutherland Court, Concord, the SLA hideout and liberated zone, was rented by Nancy Ling Perry and Russell Little, alias Nancy and George DeVoto. Concord police did not associate the name DeVoto with the SLA when Little and Ramiro were arrested. Why didn't Nancy and her male companion, who had a van and Wooly Wolf's car and all the time they needed, remove the incriminating evidence from the house when they decided to vacate the premises? They could have quietly loaded up their vehicles and quietly driven off. Instead, Nancy lit a fire in the house and split hours after R Ramiro and Little had been arrested. The sight of the flames aroused the neighbors and brought the police. The fire was quickly extinguished, and the police were left with a treasure trove containing the SLA's weapons, ammunition, posters, revolutionary documents, blackface makeup, gas masks, maps, typewriters, cyanide bullets, and communiques. The police found lists of prison officials and their wives and families who were marked for assassination. 
Records indicate that the FBI immediately placed these people under protective watch. The Sacramento authorities immediately rushed through provisions for prison guards' families. The California Senate hearings immediately received information about the SLA and its involvement with California prisoners, and Senator Harmer immediately began talking up the kidnap scare at Mormon lunches. SLA death warrants for executives of California Industries were also duly noted. But the police said not a word about the names of the SLA members who could have been arrested and locked up 24 days before Patty Hearst was kidnapped. And for almost three months, they did not reveal that they had found notes about Patty Campbell Hearst, ambush art student, and other information indicating that she might be kidnapped. And they did not warn the Hearsts either. The information found in the Concord safe house was used to link a rash of scare kidnappings around the country to the fictitious SLA. An apartment at 627 15th Street in Oakland was another SLA safe house. This one was turned by the police, the SLA Intelligence Information Headquarters, unquote. William Harris rented that apartment on December 15, 1973, one month after Dr. Foster was murdered. He and Emily lived in a lush, comfortable apartment nearby. What purpose did this Intelligence Information Headquarters serve? Nobody lived there. It was hardly used except by Harris, who carefully stocked it with more incriminating evidence. Police stumbled, unquote, on this location several weeks after Patty Hearst was kidnapped. At the time, Emily and William Harris were not suspects in either the Foster murder or the Hearst kidnapping. They had several weeks to vacate this totally useless apartment of books and weapons before the police found it, unquote. Inside the apartment was the famous mini-manual of the urban guerrilla warfare that Saxby would quote. Right-wing extremists quickly picked up the line and booklets were printed and sold over the air, quote, how to prevent your child from being recruited by radicals, unquote. Why terrorists behave as they do, unquote, and how our prison guards are becoming, how our prison grounds are becoming breeding grounds for revolution, unquote, were written and published by W.S. McBurney, the same author who hurriedly wrote A Communist Killed Our President, unquote, a decade earlier. Specific planted evidence is seized upon and is dispatched by the wire services as proof of a large conspiracy. In the same apartment was William Harris's U.S. Army Manual from Pennsylvania. The official explanation for this book being on the premises was that it had been stolen, unquote. There was more reason to believe the SLA followed that Army Manual than the Brazilian book. Colston Westbrook served the military for seven years before heading a group that would become the SLA. Westbrook and Willie Wolfe were natives of Pennsylvania. Dr. Mar Dr. Marcus Foster and Robert Blackburn also resided there before they were targets for an assault. Russell Little visited Pennsylvania in the vicinity of Dr. Foster on his way to California. The Pennsylvania Army Manual for Terrorism is important, but passed off as if it were picked up from some shelf and served no purpose. No one mentioned the possible influence of U.S. military intelligence directing the SLA. The apartment at 1827 Golden Gate Avenue in San Francisco was another CIA SLA safe house. It was the third dwelling abandoned by the SLA, which contained carefully selected incriminating evidence, unquote. In each instance, the SLA had plenty of time to remove everything from the premises. Authorities did not know about these locations and were not close to finding their inhabitants. Yet the Golden Gate apartment contained enough clothing and other objects to fill four FBI vans. They even left a bicycle. Tanya, Patria o Muerte, Venceremos, a seven-headed cobra, and other quaint, quaint graffiti were painted on the walls. There were cockroaches, dirty female underwear, empty wine bottles, wigs, and stale bread. The SLA left a tub full of chemicals and insulting notes to the police. Marigela, the tracks coverer, would have turned over in his grave. Patty Hearst and other SLA members supposedly lived in this apartment from mid-March until May 1, 1974. The famous kidnap victim had already gone through agonizing transitions from pleading with her parents to do everything for her safe return to turning against her father, family, and fiancé, and finally to becoming a bank robber with an autom automatic weapon tucked under one arm. The next stage of shock, the utter filth and disarray found in the SLA safe house, would graphically illustrate her social and psychological degradation. The apartment was only 14 blocks from the FBI office. It even had a telephone. Photographs taken at the bank robbery were published conspicuously in every newspaper and magazine, yet none of their neighbors paid the slightest heed to the nine oddly assorted new tenants 
unquote. The Golden Gate apartment was meant to horrify us as well as to hasten Patty's conversion to the SLA. In each case, the SLA had ample time to remove and destroy the evidence. Instead, the provocateur left plenty of propaganda, their kidnapping lists, mini-manual, and their bug-infested garbage. The police and the FBI would use it all to feed the anxious news media with more of the same diet of lies we have been fed for the last ten years. Filth and the mini-manual did exist. They were used to illustrate selective examples of political propaganda. Evidence of military intelligence to support conspiracies is ignored. Continuing. Oh, by the way, the next section is called Tactical Support. The SLA received many kinds of tactical support. Unnamed and unsought agents provided housing, transportation, weapons, supplies, food, rented cars, and information about the Hibernia Bank. If this had been a genuine terrorist group rather than a police intelligence operation, there would be many more arrests and more searches for specific people. Compare the treatment of supporters of Black Panthers, Muslims, Black Liberation, or members of Venceremos. Morton Newman got five years in jail for simply acting as a lookout against police after Ronald Beatty escaped from Chido, Chino. Christine Johnson met the SLA members on an earlier trip to San Francisco. She was expecting them when they arrived at the Death House on 54th Street in Los Angeles late Thursday night, May 16th, in two vans. She is not charged with any crime. Florence Lishy, owner of the burnt-out house in which Christine had sheltered the SLA, has just received an advance payment from the city of Los Angeles. Quote, God bless his honor, the mayor, the city attorney, bless them all, she said, waving a check for $489. She had been promised another 80000 to follow soon. Three SLA safe houses were left filled with incriminating and provocative evidence, but there were other safe houses that we are not supposed to ask about or discover. Many so-called, quote, blunders by police and the FBI were really examples of police collusion, but some visible evidence of tactical support can't be written off as, quote, errors. Two SLA members are in prison. Six more have been cremated. The FBI and police are looking for, quote, the last three, Emily and William Harris and Patty Hearst. But how do they explain the tactical support the, quote, last of the SLA are receiving now and received in the past? It's simple. They just don't mention it. 1. Safe House at 1476 7th Avenue, Oakland. This apartment was the staging area for the murder of Dr. Foster. Early in October, Joseph Romero rented a top-floor apartment, one of 14 units. The building was in walking distance, six-tenths of a mile, from the Oakland School District building where Foster was murdered and Robert Blackburn was shot. Clayton Mosley, manager of the building, is a private security guard. According to Mosley, six members of the SLA used the apartment from October 1st until the end of November. Emily Harris, alias Anna Lindenberg, obtained a driver's license on September 26, 1973, using this address. William Harris, alias Jonathan Mark Salamone, also gave out this address on September 26, 1973. How far in advance did the Harrises know this safe house would be available for them? No one in the 13 other units, including manager Mosley, knew the six LA, SLA members had moved out. Quote, No one actually lived in the apartment at all, but several people came and went at all hours, said Mosley. He added, This group of young people didn't seem like the others here. On December 6, 1973, when the rent was due, Mosley, quote, discovered no one was living in the apartment. Where were the police and the manager after the Foster murder five blocks away? A safe house is exactly what is implied in the name, safe from discovery. Safe House from January 10th to mid-March 1974. The SLA went underground after the January 10th arrest of Romero and Little. They gave up their apartments, jobs, and outside contacts. There was enough evidence in the abandoned house on Sutherland Court in Concord to identify Gary Atwood, William Harris, Nancy Ling Perry, Patricia Soltisic, and William Wolfe. Why weren't they found? Where did they live after January 10th? Who arranged for the, quote, combat headquarters where Patty Hearst was taken on February 4th after her kidnapping? Who rented it, and when did they give it up? If the SLA moved to the Golden Gate Avenue apartment in San Francisco in mid-March, where did they live from January 10th until then? Is the rent on that safe house still being paid? And if so, by whom? Would the Vence Ramos get that kind of protection if they had murdered one man, shot another, and kidnapped Patty Hearst? Number three, two black men and a third person, a 
a small man or possibly a woman, participated in the ambush that killed Dr. Marcus Foster and wounded Robert Blackburn. Who was this third person? Some news accounts speculate that it was Nancy Ling Perry. Other news stories describe the third person as oriental and possibly female. Why has no effort been able been made to identify or locate the third party? An oriental woman was picked up and questioned by police on the day of the murder. She had weapons in her car. Could this woman have been Jean Chan, Dave Gannell's friend and a tutor at the BCA in Vacaville? 4. Two black men and a white woman kidnapped Patricia Hurst. If Sin Q was one of them, who was the second black man? Thero Wheeler, an escapee from Vacaville Medical Facility, was named as a suspect in the Hurst kidnapping. The authorities say only three SLA members are still at large, the Harrises and Patty Hurst. Why are they ignoring the second man who allegedly assaulted Stephen Weed and kidnapped Patty Hurst? Will a yet unnamed police provocateur testify before the grand jury, receiving immunity when he surfaces? 5. Telephone service for the SLA. Who put it in? Who took it out? Lola Evans, partially blind, listened to the noises of the SLA who lived in the apartment upstairs on Golden Gate Avenue in San Francisco. She said they made a lot of phone calls. We all know the telephone company has records of every phone call. Who did the SLA call? Telephone company employees could have recognized the faces of SLA members following the well-publicized bank robbery pictures and massive search for the SLA. Between the time the SLA rented the apartment in mid-March and the time the FBI arrived, the apartment house got a new manager, who conveniently had no knowledge of who had rented the apartment. Why the change in managers? And how did the SLA manage to stumble on a location with a blind lady living below them and no other witnesses? 6. Who rented the two green cars used for the Hibernia Bank robbery? Two rented cars used by the SLA were abandoned nine blocks from the FBI offices. Who rented them to or for the SLA? Car rentals require the presentation of a valid driver's license and handwriting and possibly fingerprints on an application form. Some employee somewhere might remember a face. 7. Why the confusion and contradiction regarding when the getaway cars were found after the bank robbery? Some reports stated that the two, two green cars were found one day after the robbery. Some reports say that it was three days later. Which was it? Three days later, police in Monterey, California were still searching for the two green cars. If they had already been located, why were the police still searching 100 miles south of San Francisco? 8. Familiarity with the San Francisco Hibernia Bank James Smith, the bank manager, said he watched the SLA robbery from a spy hole in his upstairs office. Quote, It was done in such a precision-like manner, he said. They seemed to have a knowledge of the bank, knew where to go and what to do. How did the bandits know that the two tellers' drawer, drawers looted were the only ones open before 10 a.m.? The holdup gang entered at 9.50 a.m. The bandits also seemed to be aware that while the top drawers in the two cages that were robbed contained about $2,000 each, there was more money, about $3,000, in each of the two lower drawers, and they got that too. Bank employees apparently did not recognize any members of the SLA holdup team from pre previous visits to the bank. Strangely enough, the SLA getaway car was parked in front of 2330 Lawton Street, the former home of San Francisco Chief of Police D. Scott. When Scott lived in that house, did he do his banking early at the Hibernia Bank? Does he still maintain an account there? Thero Wheeler, suspiciously missing and, quote, protected, has a brother on the San Francisco police force. Was Wheeler a provocateur who helped the set to freeze up? Did he brief to freeze on details of the bank's operations? If the mention of these possible connections seems shocking, remember that U.S. Attorney General John Mitchell planned to kidnap radicals, so anything is possible. 9. How did Mrs. Christine Johnson find the SLA in San Francisco? Mrs. Johnson visited the SLA in San Francisco before they migrated to her little bungalow in Los Angeles. With the police, the FBI, and everyone else looking so hard for the SLA, and if there are no more SLA members and no conspirators, how in the world could Christine Johnson find the SLA in April? Mrs. Johnson almost didn't live through the Los Angeles shootout. For some reason, she woke up in the middle of the shootout at 5.30 p.m. from what she described as a, quote, drugged sleep. If she had died with the others, what a convenient way to ensure her silence. 10. Who purchased the three vans used to transport the SLA to Los Angeles? Two vans have been found and identified. Where is the third? 
One black man with a black woman and a child bought one red and white van. He used the alias Ricky Delgado, paid $1,800 in cash, and gave a phony address on Fillmore Street. When he drove off in the new van, he left an old green car behind. Under whose name was the green car registered? The new van was registered to 833 West 84th Street, Los Angeles. This address was found on a parking ticket in the van, and the L.A. P police said that the parking ticket led them to the 84th Street address. How far in advance did the SLA have this apartment? Two females from the SLA rented it from May 9th to May 17th. Who is Mr. Delgado? Does he work for the LAPD? Were the safe houses and transportation lined up far in advance, prearranged to lure the SLA to their deaths? This red and white van was abandoned by Emily and William Harris outside Mel's sporting goods store in Inglewood. 11. Two black men took Patty away. On the afternoon of May 17, 1974, a blue and white van pulled up behind the SLA bungalow on 54th Street. Who purchased or owned this van? Where is it now? Two black men took Patty Hearst from the SLA hideout and drove away. Quote, Two brothers tipped them off and got Patty out of her, out of here, for love of her. Miss Hearst walked to the van with them and drove off, unquote. As they left, one of the men whispered a final word to Donald DeFreeze at around 3.30 p.m. After they drove off with Patty, they were never mentioned. Who were they, and why don't the police care? Why has no description of them been released? 12. Who purchased the third van? Authorities said three vans brought the SLA to Los Angeles. Where is the third van? Why no description of the van, the persons who purchased the van, or the two men with Patty? 13. Who owns the house at 833 West 84th Street, Los Angeles? Van number one was abandoned at the shootout at Mel's Sporting Goods Store. The police said they knew the SLA was in town because of a parking ticket they found inside the van with the 84th Street address. It takes many weeks for the Department of Motor Vehicles in Sacramento to process a change of address. How could they have traced the abandoned van bought by someone alias Ricky Delgado using a phony San Francisco address to the two SLA girls who lived on 84th Street in Los Angeles for seven days? Which safe house did the SLA, SLA live in from May 1st to May 17th? Two white females rented and lived in the bungalow on 84th Street in Los Angeles from May 9th until May 16th. If the SLA left San Francisco on May 1st, where did they live until May 9th? Where did the rest of the SLA live from May 1st until midnight May 16th, 1974? Two females were housed in a safe location for nine days until they moved to 84th Street. But eight other SLA members needed safe housing from May 1st until May 16th. A second black man accompanied DeFries until a few hours before his death. Tactical support in Los Angeles came from LAPD agents. If these blacks had indeed been radicals, they would be sought and arrested for housing and assisting persons charged with murder, kidnap, and bank robbery. Instead, their existence has been ignored. Who is the black man who looked for a vacant apartment with DeFries on May 17, 1974? At 9 a.m. on the morning of the fatal shootout, Mrs. F. Leachy, the owner of the house that burned down when the SLA were killed, showed DeFries and another black man a vacant apartment nearby. 17. One black man one black man was with DeFries and the others inside the house on 54th Street on the night of May 16, 1974. Brenda, 17, spent the night of May 16th in the house with the SLA. She saw guns and ammunition all around. They said they were, quote, getting ready to get out Friday night. It was getting heavy, unquote. There was another black man with DeFries, unquote. Was he the same man who looked at the vacant apartment in the morning? Why haven't the FBI and the police released a description of this man? 18. One black man left at 11 a.m. May 17th and never returned. Another black man, not described as the person who slept at the house on Thursday night, visited Donald DeFries on Friday morning and left at 11 a.m. Neighbors said they had seen him before. Who was he? He drove, quote, a green Lamaze, unquote. He didn't return. Ricky Delgado, unquote, who purchased the red and white van in San Francisco, was, was described as 5 feet 11 inches tall, weighing about 175 pounds. This other friend was tall and did not fit the same description. The friend departed at 11 a.m., promising that he would return later, unquote, but he never came back. Were DeFries and his army abandoned? 19. 
One black man walked out the door of the bungalow on 54th Street just before the shooting began. Was this the signal to begin the attack? The murders at Kent State followed a single shot. Did the SWAT team know who was inside the cottage? Were they told Patty Hearst had been removed? 20. Transportation from Mulholland Drive in the Hollywood Hills to Griffith Park on the morning of May 17, 1974. On Friday morning at 6 a.m., Emily and William Harris, Patty Harris, and the kidnapped, unquote, Tom Matthews parted company. Matthews was allowed to drive off in his car, leaving the remnants of the SLA near Mulholland Drive in the Hollywood Hills. Authorities have no description of the, of the vehicle used to get the trio from Mulholland Drive to Griffith Park. Did they walk? If they needed a car, why didn't they leave Tom behind and use his? 21. Transportation from Griffith Park, Hollywood, to 54th Street, Inglewood. The Harrises and Patty commandeered a Lincoln Continental from a Mr. Sutter at 8 a.m. Where did they drive it to? Did Mr. Sutter drop them off somewhere on foot like Tom Matthews two hours earlier? Did they drive his car to Inglewood and abandon it? Who found the car and where? Who found Emily, William, and Patty? What kind of support did they receive? 22. Safe houses near 54th Street where Patty watched six members of SLA burn to death. Donald DeFries and a black male located a nearby vacant apartment a few hours before the shooting erupted. Was Patty taken to this vacant apartment by the same man who accompanied DeFries in the morning? She stated she had watched her comrades burn to death. She observed the fire without being seen and recognized. Was she placed there to further influence her thinking and her determination to stay with the SLA? 23. Two black men with Patty Hearst on Sunday night in Hollywood. L.A. District Attorney Joseph Bush accepted the testimony of Anita Alcala as sufficient evidence to indict Patty Hearst for charges that could mean life in prison. Two black men and a woman who did not match Patty's physical description knocked on the door in Hollywood and asked to rent a room for the night. When Mil Mrs. Alcala refused them, they offered her $500 for the night. When the $500 was turned down, the woman identified by Mrs. Alcala as Patty, unquote, allegedly said, quote, do you want to die, unquote. A black man slashed Anita's house dress with a knife. Then the trio departed hurriedly in, quote, a, a red car with a black top, unquote. Anita Alcala described the woman she identified as Patty Hearst as, quote, blue-eyed with long, light brown hair and wearing a long flower dress with a brown coat, unquote. This description does not match previous descriptions of Patty who has brown eyes and had recently been described as having her hair cropped short. The L.A. police at first said they did not have sufficient firm evidence that this was indeed Patty. But by the next day, L.A. District Attorney Bush had accepted Mrs. Alcala's testimony and indicated Patricia and, and indicted Patricia Hurst with charges based on this incident. Patty was officially last seen in Hollywood on May 19, 1974, with two black men. <clears throat> Yet the FBI and police insist that she is now with the Harrises. On what evidence? The FBI and the police are only seeking the Harrises and their convert, Patricia Hurst. What about the two black men? 24. Will tactical support come from a CIA safe house in the Mojave Desert? Charles Manson and his family, unquote, were moved from the Spawn Ranch in Topanga Canyon to the Barker Ranch in the Mojave Desert following their arrest and after the Sharon Tate La Bianca murders. The SLA reportedly had maps of deserts, parks, wilderness areas, and abandoned mines. At the time of the incident at Mel's Sporting Goods Store, the Harrises were buying thermal underwear, sleeping bags, and other outdoor items. Twelve and a half million acres of California desert have suddenly been closed to off-road traffic. Will Emily, and William, will Emily and William and Patty be protected in government safe houses while law enforcement officers spend the entire summer searching vans, campers, communes, airports, and highways? The excuse to hunt three SLA members has already caused arrests and persons stopped at gunpoint as possible suspects. Law enforcement officials in Ozona, Texas, set up roadblocks. Twenty-four persons were busted on pot charges. Twenty others were arrested while looking for Patty. Many people have been stopped as SLA suspects. Driving down US-101, Linda Lipset, her husband, and a female friend were followed by police. Quote, We thought they were going to shoot us, unquote. They were forced to lie face down on the pavement, and seven officers held pistols and rifles to their heads. Uh, I would interject at this point too. It, in Radio Free America number twelve, at the last uh, during the last part of it, we took a look at the Manson family and indications that it too was a provocateur organization. 
we haven't really got time to go into it at this point, but we went into the uh, adulation of the Manson family by Nazi elements in this country. Also to the fact that uh, the, there are the same sorts of indications about the Manson family that there are about the SLA, that uh, they were in fact operating as provocateur. Not the least of those indications was that was that uh, Ed Butler, the U.S. intelligence agent who staged the recording of Lee Harvey Oswald at the w, radio station WDSU in New Orleans, and uh, in which Oswald claimed to be a Marxist, that uh, Ed Butler, who then moved out to the West Coast under the auspices of William Frawley, a Ronald, close Ronald Reagan supporter, and one of the key people who uh, oh, it is Patrick Frawley, isn't Patrick Frawley, William Frawley was an actor, uh, Patrick Frawley, the uh, director of the Schick Safety Razor Company, and also a key member with the American Security Council, right-wing organization, private intelligence organization, and key American link to the World Anti-Communist League. Ed Butler went to work under his auspices and uh, wrote for his magazines, and in an article that we read on Radio Free America number 12, Butler speculates openly that uh, the Manson family was a communist revolutionary organization dedicated to murdering people with whose political views they disagree. So the... Um, the in, the possible intelligence, probable intelligence connections of the Manson family for, for going over that, Radio Free America, number 12. Well, we've looked at uh, a lot of indications that the Manson family, or the, the Simonese Liberation Army, rather, was indeed uh, an agent provocateur organization. I think a lot of this material speaks for itself, but the massive contradictions, the uh, selective investigation where some people, uh, they, they scoured the entire western United States looking for some people, others were allowed to simply walk out the totally contradictory behavior of the SLA in, in almost advertising their presence with neon signs, at least from a revolutionary standpoint, from the standpoint of someone who was functioning in a covert capacity, and all of the information they has presented do point very, very strongly in the direction of SLA as another one of these police and U.S. intelligence op provocateur operations in California, a la criminal conspiracy section of LAPD, worth noting that uh, L.A. was the final resting place, so to speak, of the so-called Symbionese Liberation Army. In the next section of, uh, and concluding section of the of May's uh, article, Why Was Patricia Hearst Kidnapped?, at least in the concluding section that we're going to read, we're going to go into uh, May's, May's analysis of the motives for the U.S. government and the California authorities to create the SLA. Okay, reading from a segment, <clears throat> overall segment is entitled, Why Was the SLA Created?, uh, and May is advancing her analysis of the, the, the whole phenomenon that was the SLA and the Patty Hearst kidnapping. And she has these numbered. Number one, create widespread fear of kidnapping and suspicions of terrorist organizations. The CIA uses kidnappings both as a diversion from their other activities and to escalate public fear. The kidnapping of Frank Sinatra Jr. immediately after the John Kennedy assassination diverted news and attention from political events. Jack Zangetti, the man who exposed this kidnapping and other matters about the JFK Oswald murders, was found dead two weeks after he revealed a few facts. Kidnapping scares are all around us now. Lethal postcards, in quotes, bombings of oil company offices, chemical poisoning, and threats of, quote, radical terrorism will escalate. The protection industry is growing rapidly. Uncertainties and fears will escalate as well. When citizens are led to believe their lives are in danger, they support more police weapons and harsher laws. Every kidnapping since February 4, 1974 should be carefully investigated. The kidnappings may be real, but the circumstances surrounding them are questionable. Some are obvious hoaxes. The kidnappers, their funding, secrecy, protection, and concealment by the FBI and police should be exposed. The kidnappings and bomb scares make the headlines. The half-hearted, superficial investigations and lack of convictions go unnoticed. The Secret Service, for the first time in U.S. history, presented an award outside the United States. It is no surprise that this was delivered to Inspector James Beaton, the man who was wounded March 30th when Ian Ball was supposed to, quote, kidnap Princess Anne. Was there any relationship between this altercation and the earlier abduction of Patricia Hearst? The Secret Service knows the answer. Were they acting accordingly, apologizing for a near-victim in a provocateur-inspired event? 